our next plenary session, Transitioning from University to the Workforce, Long-Term Financial Management Strategies for Students, will explore the financial strategies essential for students as they navigate the transition from academia to professional work. I would like to invite our moderator, Ms. Lynette Lee, Director of Resolute Planning, Sinian Bahad, and a member of MIM, and all the panelist speakers to the stage. Please welcome. Um, a very good morning to everyone. Um, after a very uh, interesting session this morning about education, whether it's worth it or not, now comes the next part, which is talking about what you do with your money. So um, let me start uh, by um, introducing my distinguished uh, panelist uh, and the experience. I'm going to go in alphabetical order. So uh, I'll start with Elvin Tan. Elvin is the president of Financial Planning Association of Malaysia. He's also the CEO of UOB KHEN Wealth Advisors, an SC licensed uh, financial planning subsidiary of UOB KHEN Securities, with a strong network of over 380 wealth advisors nationwide. He's instrumental in charting the company's strategic direction and enhance, enhancing the productivity of the company by reinforcing positive culture through vision and value statements. Under his current leadership, the company has developed UWealth, an in-house proprietary investment platform that provides wealth advisors and clients an end-to-end multi-investment assets execution and administration digital platform. Can we give him a big hand, please? <laughs> My next panelist is none other than uh, Inche Azadin Ngah Tasir. Uh, Inche Azadin is the CEO of Credit Counseling and Debt Management Agency, uh, Malaysia. He comes with 29 years of experience under his belt in the banking sector. Inche Azadin's banking career started in 1985 as branch manager with the Bank Bumi Putra Malaysia Berhad. Uh, in 1999, he joined Bank Muamalat Malaysia Berhad, and within Bank Muamalat, he rose to become the regional manager with three years. Within three years, and in 2005, he was appointed Senior Vice President of Ch Channel Management before becoming the Senior Vice President of Consumer Banking. In 2010, Inti Azadin joined Bank Simpana National as Senior Vice President and Head of Islamic Banking and served for four years in various departments before his appointment as CEO of AKPK in April 2014. The year I joined FPM. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least is uh, Malik Ali. He's the founder of BFM, Malaysia's first business radio station, which you can listen on frequency 89.9. Uh, and BFM has the reputation of asking tough questions of its business and political guests. So today is your chance to ask him the same tough questions as well. So, Malik is a lawyer by training, but an entrepreneur by vocation. His fourth venture is Life, an insured tech company that offers life insurance online. And he is also a CFP professional and does regular financial literacy videos, especially on insurance. You can check his videos at Instagram handle at FileLifeMind. Fun fact, Malik is a thing of a box entrepreneur for example, five life ads are quirky and memorable. There's a lot of also fun facts about my, my wife, but some of them say I cannot say. <laughs> so, now that everyone is properly introduced, let's get started. Now, welcome to the second plenary, uh, plenary two session, uh, transitioning from university to workforce, long-term financial management strategies for students. Now, this session is specially tailored for you uh, those who are in universities, to kickstart, which can, uh, I'll, I'll skip that because there's going to be a poll question later. Today, we'll be delving into some crucial aspects of managing your finances effectively, which will be invaluable as you navigate through your academic journey into work or business life. Because I believe some of you uh, may have family business and after you graduate, you may be going into your family business. Now, Personal financial management basics include 
goal setting, budgeting, saving, investing, debt management, tax planning and risk management. Um, up there is a table to show the different challenges each generation faces during their life and it helps one to understand their relationship with money based on their life situations as well as their family members. Um, a very quick example, for those who are maybe um, Gen Y, they may have parents who are baby boomers. So the, if you understand the challenges of uh, different uh, generations, you understand why your parents or why your children behave in such a way. All right. So um, I also want to pick up a quote which I saw recently. Uh, Lina Nair was on Bloomberg Television. She is the CEO of Chanel. And she said that generally it's Gen Z and Gen Alpha wants to buy less but buy better. So this is food for thought. And with that, I am going to go into letting my panelists speak. And I would like to invite each of them to talk about for five minutes about what they thought of this topic and what are the pearls of wisdom they're going to share with you. So I'd like to start with uh, Inche. Is Azadin, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lynette. And thank you, MIM, for having Ekifiki here today. We are very delighted to be here. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm happy to see a lot of young people here. Uh, it's good um, to be among young people. You feel younger yourself. <laughs> but uh, I know, you know, imagine, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, I was told that there are many from the universities. I can imagine, you know, you're from the university, ready to go to the employment world, armed um, with a degree, you know, bursting with hope, you know, going for the employment market. I'm very sure you're eager, you have got a lot of aspirations going, going forward. But hold your horses. Let, let, let me share some, some thoughts on this. <clears throat> I want to share you uh, a story. A case of of uh, you know a customer of AKPK because that, that's what we do. You are in AKPK. A story of unseen burden. Uh, this is a story of a young guy named Jay. You know he he was a grad, he is a graduate of IT, <clears throat> so a graduate at the age of 24. Um, got a first job, you know, with a first salary of 5,000. That's quite a lot, you know. Uh, he was very eager to go. Uh, but uh, I will tell you later, three years later, he, he came to us at the age of 27. Now, um, so he steps into the employment market, you know, and he told that he has learned a lot, you know, outside beyond the realms of technology, you know. And <clears throat> what is important is the real world out there, when you go to the employment, is pretty much not the same as the world inside the universities, you know. It's less structured out there, and it is also less, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, less protected in that sense. You know, in, in the universities, uh, you know, it's quite, uh, uh, you know, protected in some ways, you know, uh, quite structured in the way you, you run your daily uh, ways and so on. Well, outside there, it's more demanding, and there's just social norms are... Uh, very complex sometimes. So there are some, <clears throat> some things that we need to, to look at. Firstly is when you go out there, there is this thing called eager to fit. You know, you want to be fit into the, the environment, to the people, you know, the, the, the co-workers and whatnot. But we should look at it not only from the material standpoint, but it should be on the mental standpoint. How do we acclimatize ourselves with the new change of environment? How do we bring in and learn new skill set and so on? If not, we will be trapped, you know, in the terms of uh, material, you know, trying to, 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 to satisfy, to be together with people in terms of gadgets, in terms of uh, dressing and all sorts of things. Secondly is the issue of instant gratification. You know, sometimes there is a tendency that when you go on your first job, you, you have spent a lot of time, you know, in the university studying and so on. So you think that this is the time where I, I need to be rewarded. You know, I, I want to, 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 to spend <clears throat> money and whatnot. I, I have this, you know, because um, I have also children. 
I have one uh, son at the age of 27. He's working now in an uh, accounting uh, firm. So what amazed me is he, he wore a cap, you know, he wore a cap. And the cap, written on the cap is, work hard, travel harder. <laughs> so, so you just imagine, you know, the realm that, that to them, you know, they want to travel, they want to see the world and so on. So, and then the issue of sometimes impatient to grow. <clears throat> you know, you want to, you, you, you want to make the most out of everything. You want everything now. But matter of fact is, everything takes time. You know, you have to trust the process. It's akin to a tree, you know. A tree for it to grow very strongly, it has to make sure that it has got good roots. Yeah? Structured, good roots deep into the, the, the land. Then it can grow and withstand pressure, weather and so on. That it can then bring benefits to people. And because I, I must say that the new world now is very challenging amidst the social pressure that you have, unless we, you know, at last time we don't have this kind of social pressures. And easy credit, tell me, is it easy or not to get a credit card? And even if you don't have a credit card, now there is a scheme, BNPL, buy now, pay later. People say buy now, suffer later. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, the scams, you know, there are so many scams. Last time you, you, you have to get out of the house, then only you can you spend money. Now you can finish your money while in the house, you know, <clears throat> and all these online purchases and so on. And these are the burden of debts, you know, unbearable and whatnot. So back to the story of Jay. So he went out, he worked a matter of three years. He has accumulated himself five credit cards, you know, average of about 15,000 per card, max out to 75,000. So you just imagine when you max out 75,000 credit card, how much do you have to pay a minimum payment? 5%, eh? <clears throat> that's already 3,000, 3,000, a little bit more than 3,000. And over and above, he has got a car loan, you know, being a person, he wants a, a H, a Honda car. Yeah, took a, a, a loan, a, 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 what do you call, high purchase of 90,000, pay 1,200 for eight years. So you, you add 1,008 plus 3,002, how much is that? The salary is only 5,000. You know, so, so that's the, the story. So this story is not unique, it, it, it happens all the time. But what is important is <clears throat> how do you rise up? How do you go and seek help. Don't be in denial. You know, because you talk about mental stress and financial distress. It is something which is, it goes beyond, it is just not about collecting or payment of loans, but it has a lot impact on your self-esteem, on your psychological and also mental health in the same time. So, in a way, you know, you, you must be able to, to, to go out and also uh, know where to, to, to stop and also to seek help. Now, I, I just want to share in this uh, few more minutes an analogy, uh, a narrative that we talk in uh, KPK about fallen tree, a narrative of a fallen tree. You now, I read to you, you know, in the heart of the vast and whispering forest stood a tree. It towered over the canopy of centuries, its branches a testament to resilience sheltering countless life beneath the sprawling shed. As I mentioned, a tree, you know, it gives benefit to people around. However, even the mightiest being are at the mercy of time and tempest. One fateful day, under the weight of an unseen burden, the tree fell. It falls silent amidst the forest lemon, marking an end that seem as final as the setting sun. In the aftermath of the fall, the tree lay dormant. The world around it did not pause. Seasons changed, rain nourished the earth, and the sun continued its endless journey across the sky. So when things happen to you, life goes on. You, you are left, you know, you are left behind. People go, life goes on. 
you need to do something for it yourself. So the fallen tree, once a symbol of defeat, slowly but surely finds life cursing through the veins again. New shoots emerge from its base, reaching upwards towards the light. Each leaf a testament to the resilience and perseverance. This is not merely a revival, but a transformation, a testament that even in the direst circumstances, with proper support, a new beginning can flourish. Thus, the journey of the fallen tree becomes a beacon of hope for many. A new branch grows, a testament of resilience of the human spirit, nurtured by the wisdom of care for those who believe in the possibility of a second chance. So what I'm offering is, you have to take the analogy, dream big, yes, start small, but grow significantly. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was beautifully put. And now that you know that you have to have a very good foundation, I'm going to ask the next uh, uh, panelist, Mr. Alvin Tan, uh, to share his pearls of wisdom. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Alvin. I'm uh, from the Financial Planning Association of Malaysia. I think basically, uh, Inji Azadeh has summed up everything really. Yeah, so we can go off now. <laughs> All right, but I think to uh, just reinforce what uh, uh, what Inja Azadi is saying earlier on, I think uh, bankruptcy among youth is actually rising. So it's actually an important fact that we have must acknowledge this. Two reasons or two factors actually cause the bankruptcy for youth, especially your credit card and your what's that next? Anyone? Car loan. Yeah. Your car loan and your credit card. These are two main factors that actually cause, causing the rise of bankruptcy among the youth. So it's important as what Jesus Azadin is saying that uh, don't go into debt. So having a good debt management, your cash flow management, and then your uh, uh, income expenses, I think it's important. You're able to actually help you to track your expenses. I think that is important to actually guide your uh, a transition to your adulthood or your work life. I think it's much better than that in that sense. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, I think um, uh, for a person, I think it's important to have three pots of money in life. Yeah? So what's the first pot of money when you go out to work? It's actually to have an emergency fund. Okay? Build your emergency fund at least three to six months. I think that's important. Let's say, for example, if, if you're being asked to leave the workforce before you're finding the next job, at least that three to six months allow you to actually leave it to, for your next job until you find the next one. Yeah? So the first pot of money always when you come out to start working, Save money first, no? at least three to six months emergency fund. Okay? After that, then you look at having a second pot, which is your serious money. So what do what, what I mean by serious money? So serious money is actually going into your investment. Okay? Always grow your money by investing into serious. Serious money meaning that it may not be sexy, it give you a, but it gives you a consistent return. You want that to be in life, to be, have consistent return. Okay? That, that you keep bulk of your money in this serious money. And last, we go to third pot. Third pot of money is that you have to have a little bit of fun. That's why I call it fun money. Uh, for example, you like things that are sexy. For example, uh, crypto. Uh, or, or probably you want to go into gold investing. Something that you want to have fun, highly speculative, but at least we all like to have fun once in a while. Okay? But don't put all your money to your fun money. Okay? Put a little bit your consideration should be put more money into your serious money. And let's say, for example, if you don't have experience in investing into this serious money, allow expert to help you. Yeah? Thank you very much. So this is what you should do with your money. And then, um, last but not least, uh, Jake Mali. Could I have the um, poll out, please? Um, I'll do that for you. <coughs> Just give me a moment. Yeah, oh, we, can, we can do it again. Yeah. I launched um, the first one. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. I've, I could just ask uh, for you who haven't done this yet. Could you mind, do you mind just scanning, uh, scanning that and coming to something called slido.com? Um, there will be a poll there. Uh, I'll give it a minute. Yeah. And while you're scanning, the question is, have you participated in any financial literacy programs before? 
So you can put your answer there. Yeah, and uh, this uh, this applies not just to students, but also professors and you know executives and all that. Um, everyone you know, in this room. Everyone in this room, just to have a sense. Alvin, I put uh, you're right. I do have play money, twenty <laughs> percent. Not not so much crypto, but speculative stocks and things like that. So um, okay, the variation is this, right? The variation is crazy. It, one, some are down by ninety five percent. Some are up by a thousand percent. So, uh, net net up fifteen twenty. But you know, sometimes that's that's a problem with uh, very um, your fund money. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Okay. All right. Great. Fantastic. That's good to that's good to see. Um, sixty five percent of you have participated in a financial literacy program, mm. and but there's still a significant uh, minority, a third, um, that say that. No. You, you haven't yet, right? And um, so, okay, let, let's stop there for a while. There's a second question coming up. Yes. Um, which is next one? Yeah. Um, Please scan. Yeah. And while you are scanning, the question here. It should is, be the, you should be able to get the same same page, I think. So you can. Is uh, it is on the same page? I'm no. Not too sure. Not too sure. But okay. just just scan if yeah. you don't. Is there already, right? Yeah. Okay. So do you feel confident in managing your finances? After attending the financial literacy programs, are you confident of um, managing your finances? And just adding on to the fund money, mm. my fund money went into P2P, P2P <laughs> investment okay. yeah, as yeah. well as also Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, right. how is it doing? Bitcoin should be okay unless you sold during the... I waited until it half before I actually put my money in. Okay, all right. So yeah. I'm still waiting for it to go up. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. The recent rise in uh, Bitcoin prices yes, actually helps you. Yes, yeah. I think it is. We're not advocating, okay? Just saying that this is just kind we're of We're just like sharing experiences. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Um, I think um, uh, Here we go. all of you are very confident. Well, not very. I didn't say confident. You're confident of uh, managing your finances. Uh, and that's great. Um, and that's, that's good news. Okay, I, 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 I can just finish. Wait, wait, wait. It's oh, coming okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This like this is more exciting than share market actually. <laughs> <laughs> We've got like, a much sure as This well. is like Bitcoin. Literally, it goes up every minute, right? So or down every minute. <coughs> oh, look! Okay. It's changing again. <laughs> so, I will put together. Um, if you're not sure, that means you're not confident, lah. Uh, that, that's the that's the that's the honest answer. So again, I think we have that similar um, yeah. similar change, yeah. and and uh, and actually, it's quite. To, um, it's quite normal. I think it's. Um, think there, there are some people like me, uh, very very confident, overconfident, right? Um, sometimes, and I would be part of this. So, yeah, I know how to manage my finances. Yes, I've attended financial programs. I'm a CFP. I know what I'm doing. But still, lost lost ninety five percent on some investments, right? So, um, so it does. You know, I think generally people um, uh, kind of like more often than not, slightly more biased towards being more confident over their finances than than not. Um, so, so this, so what I'm trying to uh, get at is basically, I think um, it's now it's at at college. I remember at, at, at when I was at you know, university, when I was even before university, high school, and all that. Um, I, I never had a, a session where I sat down and learned about um, about managing my own finances. Honestly, I did an accounting degree, uh, not a degree. I did an accounting um, subject. At, at university, I was a lawyer. You know, I was top in class for accounting, believe it or not. Not law, but accounting. Um, but did I know how to manage my finances? Not from, not from university, right? Um, not from school. Um, I had two role models in my managing my finances, right? One was my father, who was a free spender. You know, money in, money out, pew, right? And then the other role model was my mother, who was like, Completely the other way, right? And just uh, and just saved every single pe uh, every single cent she had, right? And and both of them passed away, but I can tell you, at the when they, they passed away, um, who do you think had more more cash when they passed away, right? My mom, and my father was this businessman, right? He's a businessman, you know, blah, blah, money, you know, all kinds of things, right? I mean, at one stage, I'm like, wow, you know, uh, you know. Dad, you're like you, this is this is you're having a great life. I you know I benefited a little bit, but then everything went went in, in 1985 recession, right? So gone, um, and then a bit back, and then gone. So 
yeah, my mom had more in cash. So my dad had some assets, I think, I didn't think, but at the end of the day, in cash, um, you know, if you wanted to talk about six months, six months um, um, emergency fund, my father did not have any. My mother had like three years emergency fund, or eight, no, at least eight years emergency fund. She put her money in, she, every time she asked me to go to um, uh, Amanah Saham and uh, print, out the, print out the dividend slip, and do, that would be the happiest day of her life. Like, like, like I get 30,000 this year? Like, yes, mom. Like, <gasps> you know, like, yeah, and that's it. I, I, you know, she should be, you know, should be you know, very happy. So what I'm trying to say is, I'm, I'm going on a bit, but what I'm trying to say is that I think um, all of us could do more rather than less. Um, I think, um, at, for example, um, the first, after university, where's the next best stage? I think employees have a huge issue as well. As, as Adin says, you know, um, you are working, you, are, you, you suddenly have income in your hands, and you like, now you want, you know, you, you don't have transport, you want to buy a car, but you don't want to buy the, you know, the, your, your kanchil, now you want your beza at least, whatever. You know, so, um, so that's when I find, and when I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I employ a lot of, I've employed uh, maybe a, a couple of, a few hundred people across the years, not huge uh, companies, but what, what I do find is that there are always pockets of, um, Financial trouble. Um, my first, one of my best employees in the very beginning came to me after about three months, four months. I, I need an advance. Uh, I have to pay off a few things. My car didn't do this. So, so that's the first month. Second month, third month, okay. And then fourth month, another advance. Uh, eighth month, another advance. And then calculated maybe about 5,000, 6,000 ringgit, right? Of debt to, the com debt to the company, of advances. And then resigned and disappeared. Right, so I, then I realized actually at first I was a bit like you know a bit upset and things like that. this is dishonest and things like that. But at the end of the day, after a while, after you employ more people, it's that it's just like actually this is quite typical in the sense that people are in in trouble and they want to the way they start off on a clean slate is by quitting their job and starting afresh and disappearing. Um, so and I, that's why um, I think um, we. Um, and in fact, when as I didn't know, we're on the same panel when the launch of the financial um, um, financial network, right? FEN. Um, the, the idea of doing an employee financial wellness, wellness program. You know, imagine if you, you join a company, and on induction day, the first day, you get a program that says, "Oh, by the way, yeah, here here are the, some of our company things, yeah, our company strategy and all that. And by the way, we also." want you to be uh, financially uh, uh, savvy. So here's something about how do you, what do you do with your salary? You know? um, could you imagine if that's something like that? So that imagination, we, you know, we kind of like have designed a program between FPAM and BFM, uh, Employee Financial Wellness Program. We've parked it for a while. We're looking for good, uh, we're looking for people who can help run it. So if anyone wants, wants to do, fig, figure it out, uh, we're happy to, but it's all, it's all designed. But we'd love to be able to like offer this to companies uh, as like to, for, the, for their programs. So what the areas, the areas are there, uh, money management, managing debts, protection, investments, and dealing and, and knowing and recognizing scams. I think that's the, the, the key ones. Um, if you are from the Gen Z generation, my daughter's just graduating. I'm going to Canada to see her graduation 23. Um, she's, sorry, she's 23 years old and she's anxious and she's, she's ambitious, as you say. She wants to, things to happen quickly. Um, she wants to put a, a down payment on a, on a first place house and things like that, a first apartment. But guess what? I, I just found out she had credit card debt and she's paying the min minimum amount. And she, she comes from a you know, father who is a CFP and you know, doing businesses and, and preaching this to the world and my own daughter kena credit card debt. Like, see, so what I'm trying to say is, is that it happens to the best of us um, and I think more financial education is better than less. Um, spread, you know, I, uh, if, get, if you are an employer, if you're a university uh, lecturer, professor, please, any chance you have, yeah, get involved. Get involved with what our students are thinking. Get involved. Give, give sound advice. Um, and if you, if you yourself don't have that advice, learn from others and then impart it to your, to your, to your, to your, to your students. I think that's the main thing. That's my, my five minute, no, eight minute start. <laughs> Thank you so much, Malik. Um, yeah, so there's, um, so we've talked about um, debts, 
you have talked about what you do with your money. We also have uh, reached out to employees as well uh, regarding where they can get the financial literacy for their staff, which is also good. Now, um, I'm going to go into questions now. So my first question is, making money and investments are always the hot topic because investment makes money. Walk us through, and this is for Alvin, yeah? Walk us through the importance of saving money, which you have. Maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more. Even with limited income, and what advice do you have for students with maybe little or no investing experience, but also bearing in mind those students who does finance and, and economics, uh, most of them would have dabbled with some form of investing or other. So maybe if you can talk about this two groups of people? Um, okay, I think before we talk about investing, I think it's always too important, yeah? Just in any game that we want to build, any strategy you want to build, you will have your uh, best striking team, yeah? This is actually the one that go out and hunt, yeah? But I think it's always good to also build your defense. So before we talk about in financial planning, before we actually talk about investing, the first thing that came in mind is actually talking about protection. You have to build your protection because it's important just imagine that if you let's say you've been hunting, 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 growing your money, but because of one illness came, hit you, then you can actually wipe off all your savings, all your investment. Agree or not? So it's important that actually you build your protection first, your basic uh, protection. So the basic first thing always call about probably your personal accident. Okay? Two important things you must get after you come to workforce, your medical card and your critical illness. That's important. Because uh, probably your parents don't need your money when you pass away. <laughs> See, but, but for example, if you're actually uh, sick or you actually met an accident, you cannot work. At least your insurance is able to actually cover that. I think it's important. And always please remember this year. Insurance is something that you buy when you're healthy. Not you buy when you need it. By the time you buy it when you need it, most likely you will not be able to get insured. Yeah, because of illness, lifestyle, or probably got high blood pressure, uh, uh, your sugar level, yeah? So I think you buy it when you're healthy, not the other way around. And when you buy it when you're healthy, the premium is always going to be low, okay? Now, then we come to our next uh, element after we build our basic protection, is actually talk about investment. Now, if you have little to no experience of investing, I think one you need to build is actually important is your regular saving or habit or regular investment habit. Build as a habit. Let's say, for example, you've been contributing EPF. Contribute probably another 10 to 15% as your personal saving, personal investment. Okay, probably put into uh, expert that are able to actually advise you uh, after probably uh, you talk to them, uh, building your uh, 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 short term or medium term or long term financial goals, whether to put a deposit to your apartment, to your house, or probably you want to probably save for your coming wedding. You know, these are some of the goals probably in your mind. Put a serious money with an expert. Build a regular saving habit. I think habit is important. Yeah? So from right on, then you start investing. What's the next question again? Basically, uh, with limited income, what advice do you have for students with little or no investing experience? I think, I, think, I think building regular saving habits are important. It's all about habits at the end of the day. Yeah? I think even for people who have many experience in uh, finance and economics, again, those habits... Okay, don't be tempted to go into high uh, yield or unreasonable return that give you probably 5% a month, 7% a month. Uh, things are too good to be true, please avoid it. There's no such thing at 5%, 7%. Okay? If let's say they are 5%, 7%, you, will, you won't have the chance to actually invest into it. Probably other people probably invest into it really. So I think it's always a lot, uh, uh, important to actually smell whether there's a possible scam out there. If you're not sure, okay, I think uh, the police force, uh, FEN, we have all the basically website to actually inform you whether this kind of investment is legitimate or not. Right? Yeah. Can I and jump in a little bit? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, if you're not sure, just say no first. Okay. <laughs> um, so I told you about my daughter, um, and, but I have a son who's three years younger than her. Um, because he's a permanent resident of Singapore, he has to do national service and he earns an income of a uh, thousand sing dollars, an allowance, they call it, an allowance of a thousand sing dollars. Singapore calls it allowance, but they don't have to pay uh, CPF on it. You know? um, 
So $1,000. So I think, so one thing I did, I, he's starting out, at first I'm like, you know, I, I like, mm, this, this, this can be dangerous. <laughs> so what I meant, it took a while. It took me about, maybe about three weeks of persuading. But I said to Rianu, his name, I said, Rianu, I tell you what, um, why don't, can, I, can we do this? When does your money arrive? Or when does your salary arrive? Oh, it arrives on the 12th, 12th of every month. Okay. It, I think it's important for you to, you know, I think it's good for you to save, you know, you might need some extra cash in future. Can, I, on the, can we do a like automatic deduction on the 14th of every month of $200? into, uh, I said, hmm, nah, let's choose one of these guys, stash away, right? Let's try to do this. Most aggressive portfolio because you're very young, right? And um, he's like, hmm, what's my dad up to? Huh? <laughs> he was very suspicious. And I'm like, please, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, look, I, I promise you, you, after that, after you put the $200 away, that 800 that you have left, you can do anything with it you want, anything, right? And that he, he liked the sound of, right? He's like, okay, uh, if, 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 that deal. Okay, so now 200 of it goes every month. He doesn't even see it. By the time he looks at it, he thinks he has 800. 1,000 comes in, 200 goes out. Done, right? So he has 800. And true enough, every month, you know, he just, you know, like, got money, must, must buy something or something. But at the end of the day, um, this, we are playing on human psychology, right? You, do, you give them, uh, human psychology is to use up, like my father, use up everything in your account, right? Um, so, unless you are like my mother, if someone has like my, my father's psych psychology, then I think that the way to do it is to say, all right, hide it away from them or let them hide it away themselves and then they don't, so they don't care. It's almost like, again, like, see, like uh, our EPF, lah, yeah? It goes, you don't know, you kind of like, you don't see the benefit of it until, you, until later on you're like, oh wow, thank goodness I did that. So we do the same as well. So I would encourage uh, for those of you coming to the workforce to do that to ourselves, to in a way understand our impulses, our human impulses to spend um, and you know, uh, with instant gratification, but, but you can, now you can do it completely, what's the word, completely like uh, without worry. You put, you put some away and off you go. You can spend, you know, whatever, right? So that's, that's um, uh, a tip. Okay, that's a good, good one. Um, actually, the next question is for you, but you have kind of answered it already. Okay. All right, um, I'll just move on to Inji Azadin. Um, well, smart money management will always help one to decide how to budget and use their money optimally, as been shared by the two gentlemen here. Now, um, Inji Azadin, how can students differentiate between needs and wants when they manage their expenses? Okay. Um, I'll talk on the smart management a bit, uh, but before I just address the needs and wants, um, I think it's, it's very basic. Everybody knows about what is a need, what is a want. When you talk about need is, you know, food, shelter, clothing, you know, that's a need. When you talk about wants is when you talk about entertainment, travel, luxury items, right? But let me just put some color or perspective to the needs and wants, uh, because sometimes the needs and wants is not as simple as that. You know, it changes over time. It varies different from different people to different people. You know, what can be uh, a seem as a, a one to someone else is actually a need to someone, somebody else. And also, issue is also when we try to insulate those needs with additionals, add-ons, then it become ones. And for example, you say uh, shelter. You need a house. A house. But once you say, uh, I want uh, uh, the, the house should be in Bangsa, <laughs> then it becomes a one. And uh, so, so, so you're putting pressure on yourself. But all this, if, as I said, needs and want evolve over time. When uh, my time when I was a student, uh, having a transportation is a one. And we walk to, 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 to lectures. But nowadays, it's a need for you to have transportation. You know, it changes over time. And it's also shaped by uh, cultural, you know, by uh, environment and whatnot. So, but this is also some trap when you talk about this mentality of uh, need and wants. Because sometimes if you confine your, your mentality towards needs and not, uh, you know, we will say is, is need bad, good or wants bad, you know. But if we, we put uh, to that kind of mindset, Sometimes if you confine to needs, needs are somewhat restrictive in a manner. 
it doesn't give a lot of uh, give you motivation, you know, to do things and so on because you you tend to be complacent. You know, we we have, for example, issues, you know, in 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 the zakat, for example, you know, people zakat recipients, you know. Over years, over years, they have been receiving zakat, you know, money, uh, assistance, but they do not have this ambition to one day to pay zakat. You see, so you so you need to 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 drive that one in them, so that you will change, you know, from from being a recipient to 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 to, to uh, making payment. And likewise, if you are trapped in the mentality of having ones all the time it can also open up a lot of issues in the sense that it can create financial strains to you. You know, you will be unrealistic demands, then it will open up to you living with beyond your means. You know, then there are issues of corruption, the issue of embezzlement and all sorts of things. Yeah? And you tend to start comparing, you know, keep up with the Joneses. Yeah? Never buying a new car, you, you, do you want, you also want to do a new car. So that's some basic understanding of what uh, wants and needs. But otherwise, if you talk about the level of financial literacy, I, I saw the questions asked just now. <clears throat> I'm happy to note, uh, you know that about 60% have attended somewhat, but 30% have not attended. We ran a survey recently also, uh, you know, to, to among employers in the workplace to see whether is there a demand you know, and uh, supply and demand of financial literacy uh, uh, modules and also shops available in the workplace. So apparently there's a lot of demand, but the supply is, is lacking. Uh, so this is something that uh, probably out of this we can, we can also look into all this. But having said that, as, uh, other than that, uh, the level of financial literacy, Bank Negara, we run uh, financial literacy surveys over the years from the year of 2015 until 2021. Uh, we have what we call MyFlix Index, you know, Malaysian Financial Literacy Inclusion and also Capabilities Index, where we are among the OECD countries are basically in the middle. You know, we just increased shortly about, about 56 to 59 in a percent in, in uh, 2021. Some improvement. But then again, uh, we have to make stride in, in um, savings, as we say, you know, uh, save after what is left, not save what is left after spending, but basically spend what is left after, after saving. So that should be the modality. You know, they always say about 50, 30, 20 rule, a rule eh, that you should spend uh, 50 on your essentials, 20, 30 on your uh, uh, designary, yeah, and 20 on your savings. Yeah. So AKPK, we do a lot of programs with the universities. Uh, I think over the years, we have got uh, what we call selfie, uh, Kampara Bijak Uang, Jelajah Bijak Uang, Fit Finances, a lot that we do with for education. Uh, I think over the years from 2017, uh, 2019, uh, no, sorry, 2016 onwards, we have uh, more or less uh, touch more than 20 to 30,000 uh, students. But the items of the idea that we taught them is, is more on the impact and experiential learning. Because this is how you want to give them uh, learning. Because if you give classroom learning, you will not be able to absorb uh, these, these uh, ideas. Uh, the maxim is always earn, manage, and you talk about save and give. You know, at the end of the day, you must teach them how do you earn money, how do you manage it, how do you save investments and all sorts of things. But at the end of the day also, you need to give back, share, you know, what your wealth to the society, to those that need, so that, that it can flourish uh, more and more in terms of your income and so on. Thank you. I think that's... Okay, thank you very much. And over to Elvin. Um, I think you've <clears throat> spoken at length about financial goals. Uh, and long-term goals. Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, for the uninitiated uh, in investment, what do you think is the basic that they must know before they actually go into investment? Um, okay, before they go into investment. Well, I think all these um, golden rules of investing, I think first important thing is to actually understand your objective. 
why are you investing, first thing? Is it investing for your retirement? Is it investing for putting down payment for a house again? So all these objectives, you must be clear. What are you investing for? Because, for example, that uh, uh, areas that are short-term, probably you probably want to have uh, more conservative because these are short-term goals that you think that you cannot screw up that investment. But if you actually have longer term, for example, saving for your retirement, and you're still young, okay, of course, you can take higher risk okay, because you have a long-term uh, tenure to accumulate for that. So first thing is actually understand your objective. And then, uh, of course, then you must always, always, second is actually understand your risk tolerance. Doesn't mean that you're young, uh, that means you're highly aggressive. You could be sometimes you're, you're a bit scared. You cannot lose your capital. That shows you're, you're somebody who are actually very conservative. So I think had, having understanding your risk level actually play, uh, plays a role as well. And then uh, third thing is actually regular investing. Okay? Uh, it's not timing the market. It's always about time in the market. The longer that you actually invest throughout the time, of course, you're able to have a very much better or consistent return throughout. Yeah? I think with all these uh, golden rules of investing, I think it's important. I think last but not least, also important. Yeah? Re always remember this, diversify your investment. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Okay? Don't put everything into the stock market, for example. Or don't put into all uh, equity or single country fund, say for example. You should actually diversify your investment into probably uh, different asset classes, uh, different uh, geog geographical location. Okay? So these are all the important tips. But again, that if you're not experienced or having little knowledge, of course, talking to an investment expert, a financial planner will always help you. Thank you very much. Now, on to Maling. Maling, <laughs> um, just coming back, and this makes reference to the table that uh, we showed earlier. Um, I'm sure things have changed a lot from your uni days to today. Maybe you can give a little bit of uh, personal experience. And now that you also have your, one of your child going to, in university, and at the same time, uh, based on the table, there are different cha financial challenges to the generations. What do you think is the biggest financial challenges that university students are facing today, and how can they overcome them? Uh, I'll start, uh, yeah, I think the financial challenges of students today, um, things globally, I think what has happened is that um, prices of everything has gone up. Um, consumer prices, food, but also um, uh, houses, real estate, uh, property. I think that's the biggest challenge that this new generation is going to enter the workforce. And how do you save up for that? You know, I don't know, it's, these days is what, 700,000 to get an apartment in KL, if, if at all, right? 700,000, 20% down is about, what, uh, 140,000? Your salary is about 3,000? How are you going to get 240,000, right? How many years would you get 240,000? And so on, right? So I think that's the, it's, it's okay if you have, you know, like, you know, um, maybe middle class or, you know, parents who have some, some things to, to, you know, to help you out with your down payment. But if you don't, how? Right? So I think that's the biggest challenge is that it, the incomes has not kept up with, um, with, asset, with property prices and things, things that people feel is a need to, to have a roof over your head. It feels like a need. Of course, bangsa versus, you know, versus um, you know, bangi, right? So, um, so I think that's the biggest one. The second thing I think as well is that there is a lot of shiny objects out there, meaning not just in terms of things, right? Okay, but there's also shiny objects in terms of investments, right? Um, you hear of peers making, you know, 50%, you know, over six months in crypto, even one month or whatever. And I, I remember my whole office, the whole BFM office, there's two guys at BFM, a guy called Richard Bradbury, and at the time another, sorry, he's left, the other person left already, but they were talking crypto all the time. And they kind of like, their enthusiasm was just amazing. They're like, wow, you know, I mean, last, yesterday I made a thousand, yesterday I made a thousand ringgit, da, da, da. just yeah, one night, and everyone's listening, you know? And when we preach 5%, 7% per annum, people are like, boring, lah. you know, like, no, I don't want to listen to you. I want to listen to the 5% per day, you know, kind of, kind of like thing. So that's the other thing. And then, they, they, then crypto collapsed, and then the second wave came. And then these guys go, I told you so, I told you so. Yeah. Um, so, 
Um, so there's, there's a lot of shiny new objects out there um, in terms of investments. So um, there's also other things. I think youth also, you have to be very careful about, um, oh, this is a fantastic job. It pays, you know, 5,000 US, uh, but it's overseas, right? And then before you know it, you were somewhere in Laos, in a, yeah, Cambodia, in a, in, a, in a thing, right? So these are crazy things that are happening. And be it's because we are in a rush. I, as I can understand it. You are in a rush to make money so that you can afford to be, you want to be stable and you want to afford the thing. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, uh, people on Instagram, on TikTok saying, you know, there's easy money to be made. Right, and actually, it isn't. Um, it's not. Uh, you know, um, there's one saying which is, um, "Is investment should be as boring as watching the paint dry." Right? Now, and it's not. It's not a crazy idea. If you, I mean, supposing you just put, you know, ten thousand or say one thousand ringgit in the uh, S M P, uh, the U S stock market, the whole index. That means you buy the whole S M P five hundred. In US dollar terms, you have earned about, for the last 20 years, you have earned 11% per annum. And that's watching the paint dry. 11% per annum, you just want. EPF, watching the paint dry, 5 to 6% per annum. Watching the paint dry. So it doesn't appear like this, but it's okay, right? You're watching, you know, so you're putting that amount aside uh, for, for investments that are watching the paint dry. And as Alvin, Alvin said, then you have your fund money where you can afford to lose your 10%, whatever it is that you want. I think that's okay. Then that one you can go for your, you know, you can go for your, you know, try NVIDIA, la, try, you know, try, you know, maybe Google, you know, uh, things like that. Sorry, I'm not supposed to recommend stocks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think, but the challenges will be there. Um, I think uh, at, you do need to invest uh, to catch up with asset prices, house prices. You do need to invest it fairly aggressively. Um, that's for sure. Um, you cannot just leave. You cannot just kind of like put it in fixed deposit and expect it to overtake. You know, you can grow that grow that along. No, I, that that would not happen. Uh, so it's interesting. That's. I hope, I hope more companies will do this. At BFM, uh, I've, okay, every now and then what I've done is, uh, we've done a program um, where, you know, okay, here's your bonus, okay. But I kept a little bit of the bonus for one more thing. I said, all right, if you can show me that you invested 3,000 uh, 3, ringgit, we will be testament to this, right? No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not bluffing. If you invest 3,000 ringgit, we'll put BFM, we'll put 1,000 towards more investment for you, right? So you put three, I put one, or we put one. And, you know, so we put, opened up and just said, look, there's 70 employees, go for it, you know? And, um, and yeah, I think, uh, and you, don't have, you know, so I, I think for us, um, that's a way of encouraging. Uh, I, I, I would love to see more employers kind of like do this sort of incentive things. I learned all this from Singapore, lah. Uh, Singapore government does this very, very well. You, you want to start, start up, okay, you put 1,000, you get VC to put 1,000, I put 1,000, you know? It's like, it's risk sharing, it's alignment, alignment of incentives, uh, and so on. So I think that's the kind of um, uh, thing that I think, uh, so please, uh, if you are, that, that challenge of asset prices, you can, there is a way, not easy, but uh, it's, it's, you know, having solid, uh, investing it, not saving it, not like my head of sales. He's 67 now, save all his life in fixed deposit, right? And then never, never invest, really truly invested it. But it's okay. He has no children, this and that. He'll be fine. But I, I, I go up to him and say, can I introduce you to a financial planner who will help you invest? No, 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 no. I've seen the 85 stock market. I've seen the 97 crisis. I've seen everything. I'm not going to invest. I ask Usala, then hard lah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Malik. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe, I don't know, the youngsters in this room, is there a game of uh, financial management in Roblox? If none, maybe you should start something like this and we'll be happy to uh, help you to create that game. All right. Now, um, yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, put it on Slido and we're happy to take it. And if anybody wants, there's floating mics out there, you can uh, ask yourself. Um, but one final question I want to ask, and that one is uh, to Inja Azadin. Um, what are the common financial debts uh, fresh grads face today? 
Are these debts affecting the foundation of their personal finances? Um, people always say that modern slaves are not in chains, but they're in debts. <laughs> so uh, I'll share you some statistics uh, back in the KPK, you know, what are the kind of uh, debts that are involved, especially some uh, to youngsters, graduates and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> rightly said, much uh, Elvin said this now, the top most uh, debt is credit card and uh, personal loan. Yeah, credit card, personal loan. Uh, with us, it's about 53% is credit card, 32% is personal loan. Those are the kind of things unsecured that people have issues and they will come to us. And <clears throat> we talk about the reason for it, uh, Malik rightly say high cost of living, you know, salary, and you talk about poor financial planning. You know, they do not really plan uh, their finances. You know, when you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. Yeah? And you look into the, the years, the 20 to 30 years, uh, although it's only 12%, majority is between 30 to 40 years old, which is about 43%, which are in our debt program. But reason being, if you do not take care of your finances when you are in the 20s, it will spiral when you are in the 30s. That's where you start having pressures. You have housing loans then, you have got car loans, you have children. You know, that's where your debts will spiral and that's where you start having issues if you don't take care of it during, during your uh, younger days. And as far as student loans, PTPTN and so on, we have got over close to 9,000 people who are in the program. Now, mind you, uh, when a person have got PTPTN loan only, we will not put in our program. We will send them back to PTPTN, uh, you deal and restructure with PTPTN. But these are people who have PTPTN loans apart from other loans that they have credit cards, personal loans and whatnot. <clears throat> so, in a nutshell, um, um, Alvin mentioned about bankruptcy. Uh, car loan is the most uh, reason why people uh, bankrupt because they sell the, the car, it's already repossessed, it's, a, it's basically the loss of the sale. You know, that's the one that, uh, you know, they have been chased after. And secondly, is the personal loan. But what is the real reason of bankruptcy? I ask you. It is not personal loan or it is uh, a car loan or what. It is attitude. That's the reason why the high number of bankruptcy. Because people just do not want, they think that they can run away from debts. You know, they think that by, by switching off their phone, by not opening letters from the banks, the problem can go away. If you come forward, you know, to, 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 de to deal with it, there are always avenues, you know, for the banks or especially us in AKPK, for us to really look into how do you stay your float? How do you make you survive so that you will not be instituted to all this long-term, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call bankruptcy, legal action and whatnot, so that you can stay active in the employment and whatnot. Let me just quote what Susie Oman mentioned. That uh, an advice from Susie Oman is what he mentioned. Your money is governed by how you treat it. It strives if you are being responsible, respectful, and doing honorable things with it. How we treat our debt plays a major role in our path to financial freedom. You know, debts are meant to be paid. You know, so if we have that kind of seriousness and attitude and keep our life to the basic, even as Malik mentioned, investment is about being basic. Yeah, just being basic. I think you will rise and then you will also survive in the financial maze and you will achieve financial wellness and financial well-being, inshallah. Uh, just be before you put down the mic, this is a follow-up question to what you've just shared because there's a question from Slido that says that what if the person already have multiple debts? A, what can he do? Uh, multiple debts is where AKPK's role uh, is there. You know, when you have debts with an individual bank, 
we will, we will normally ask you to go back to the bank and discuss. You know, what's the best method, what is the amount of payment and so on. But when you have got multiple loans, it is almost impossible for you to go and meet those five or six banks to discuss. Because at that point of time, you know, when you have issues, you, you cannot pay. Not many people want to see you. See? So when you come to AKPK, we will be able to, because our role is basically to be the in-between. We will talk for you on your behalf to the banks to accept an amount which is palatable to you at that point of time. You know, at, um, probably you do not have, you, you are paying, for example, 2,000 for all the loan, five or six loans, but you can only, you know, manage to pay, you can only afford to pay 1,000. That's our role, you know, because basically all those people that come to us for help, their debt to service ratio is already, already between 70 to 80 percent. That is loan repayment. You have not put in the, the living expenses and whatnot. And that is where our role comes in. We will help you to talk to the banks and so on. And we can help reduce the amount that you pay, you know, to at least to 25 percent, 50 percent of what uh, you have been paying. But of course, it involves a reduction of interest, extending the loan tenure and so on. Yeah. And I vouch for that because I've sent two people to AKPK and they've done a wonderful job. Okay, um, there are a lot of questions here and I think the questions are very relevant. So um, to the management of MIM, I'm just wondering whether we could put the questions up on, on, the, on the screen so that um, my fellow panelists can answer those questions. Yeah, hi, on team, just put, put it on slide, yeah, slide could, could yeah. we Could we have all the questions? Yeah. Yeah. And whilst waiting for that, we'll... Uh, yeah. 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 There's one question. Mike, for, for this gentleman here. Yes, okay, good. Um, hi, my name is Mohamed, I'm from TVTiga, but I'm here as a participant, I'm not, a, I'm not here as a reporter, so... <laughs> um, yeah, so the EPF recently announced the introduction of a third account, which allows EPF members to withdraw money from their EPF savings practically for anything effective June, which is next month. Um, this is despite the EPF having said many times before that a staggering majority of Malaysian workers will not have enough retirement savings when they retire, especially due to the special withdrawals during the pandemic. Uh, and now they're allowing uh, this option permanently. So I'm just curious to know what the panelists have to say about this. Thank you. Anyone wants to take this question? Okay, um, from my personal standpoint, I actually don't agree to this account three. I think it actually defeat the whole purpose. Our EPF is actually meant for our retirement savings. I think that, that's the ultimate goal at the end of the day. But of course, when you have flexibility, I think if I could create flexibility, I can create anywhere. I can create on my own. But then again, um, understanding this also about um, cost of rising cost of living. So there's actually um, probably there are group of people that may not be able to afford to put extra money on the saving itself. Hence, probably having a country to cater for that group of people, of course, that actually helps. But then you have to ask your question back to you again, whether you actually fall in that, that group or not. If you're not, then I will suggest don't withdraw. Yeah, just keep it into EPF and let it grow due to your retirement. Yeah, I hope I answered that question. Or oh, any panelists would like to. Yeah. Huh? Okay. So um, I hope the answer, the question is answered. Um, and then there's another one that says, "What is the best investment portfolio for retirees?" Last question. Anyone wants to take this? Elvin? <laughs> yeah, we're all looking at you. All right, all right. Uh, best investment portfolio for retirees. I wish I have the answer. Okay, but actually, to be honest, it um, actually depends on the person's risk profile again. And then uh, if you're saving for retirement at that time, and probably you're already in that retirement mode, then of course, you can't do much. Your asset has to be very, very conservative. Yeah, it could be placing into fixed income. That probably uh, be, uh, probably... Uh, a balance with uh, high concentration into fixed income, probably about 30% into equity. I think that probably uh, would place a better balanced portfolio for uh, retiree during that period of time. Yeah. So that would be my answer. Yeah. 
I, I can, okay. So I just want to contrast, right, Mohammed, um, with what is happening in Singapore. Singapore CPF, right? Singapore went the other way. Instead of allowing you to take money out, you, at 55, you can't take your money out. You cannot take out 270,000 of your money. What do they do with it? That 270,000, they invest it to give you an income of, uh, when you're 65, to give you an income of about 2000, $2,001, $2,200 per month for the rest of your life, right? So you live till 90, doesn't matter. That 2001, jalan, right? So I think, so, in, 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 so I can see the contrast. I, I know we come from different places. Singapore, you know, basically high, I mean, it's one of the highest income countries in the world. We're not, um, and I understand all that. But I think you, there are, you know, the, the, with right policies and so on, I think you can start to create um, um, sort of, in a way, it's a social safety net of sorts. Lah. So for, I guess in Singapore now, if I, I would, in fact, now they allow you, you, you can put 430,000, you can leave 430,000 inside your CPF, you get 3,100 a month for the rest of your life. And I'm like, wow, you know, for me, if, if, you, if this conversation was in Singapore, no brainer, leave your money in CPF and get your income when you want to 65 onwards, you're taken care of. Malaysia, a bit harder. Malaysia, you have to do it yourself. DIY, yeah. yes, you can put something with, uh, definitely leave things, uh, leave, leave it with EPF. You cannot buy, an, if you cannot find a better return than five and a half percent, leave it there, right? Don't, don't touch it, right? But if there are, you know, uh, other areas, uh, for example, I think right now if you were to get a US dollar treasury bill, it costs five point something percent or something like that. Oh, that's, you know, that's also quite comparable. Well, EPF is doing it for you, but if you want to go traveling, for example, you know, our ringgit is always going down. You want to go traveling, you want to buy US Treasury bill, and then 5.5%, we'll buy your US dollars 5.5% right now, right? So that's the kind of, um, thing. but I, for definitely for retirees, it's a very conservative. Conservative means income producing. Uh, you're not, I wouldn't buy NVIDIA. <laughs> Um, but maybe, yeah, uh, but you, you know, as you say, 30% equity, but maybe buy, uh, maybe buy a bond fund or something that, that, that can help give you an income. Yeah, I think the question about recommended percentage, you have covered that already, so we can skip that question. Um, the other uh, question that, uh, what is your advice on the mental health of young adults with regards to their financial habits? Um, gentlemen, anyone would care to take that question? I'll take it um, because Thank you. I've started businesses before. I mean, I am still starting businesses. And when you start a business, you're, you are worried, right? Um, especially in the early years. Um, my first business, uh, I had sleepless nights, right? Um, I started it a bit unlucky in terms of timing, but also inexperience. I started it two months before the Asian financial crisis, 1997. Uh, I borrowed, there's no venture capital at the time. I borrowed money. I borrowed about you know, 300,000 ringgit to start my first business, and that business went zero. Uh, so I was 31 years old, 300,000 ringgit debt, uh, interest rates were high, and uh, you know, and I had to figure it out. So just to put things in perspective, I think it took me about seven, eight years to get out of that, um, which is lucky in my mind. Uh, I, I was very lucky in the sense that you know, I, had, uh, I, I joined Job Street and Job Street did very well, um, enlisted and things like that. So I, I had cash to pay, back, to pay back my loan and all that. But it could have been much, much worse. I could, it could have taken 14 years, 15 years, right? even until today for me to pay back right? that $300,000 loan. So the mental health of that was, I didn't describe it as mental health, but it was really, it was really you worry about it. Right? You, you know it's affecting you when you are not sleeping. When you're thinking about it before you go, you know, you're like, it niggles at the back of your mind. And honestly, it happens, uh, as an entrepreneur, it happens to me quite a lot, right? Meaning, every time you start a new venture, right? I mean, even at Job Street, right? I'm, uh, we, I was spending a marketing budget. I couldn't sleep for five, five nights because of the amount I was spending to market Job Street was more than we had in the bank, right? I couldn't sleep. Right? Um, yeah, so that's my thing. Um, so when you see, uh, so how do you deal with that? Actually, it's, okay, I, maybe I'm a Gen Xer. I mean, one part of me says, you just have to deal with it. The other, but the other part of it is having a good uh, a peer group that you can kind of like discuss this with 
really helps. For example, with Job Street, I remember talking to my Job Street co-founders, and they go going, "Hey, I, I, you know, this is a huge issue. I'm spending thing we, we don't have." And then you know, we talked it over, and then you know, one of the found, co-founders said, "You know, Malik, it's okay. I, I'll backstop this. If something happens and you know it doesn't work, I'll backstop it. Meaning, I will put the money into the company." Okay, we sorted it out, right? So that's something. So we need to to talk it out. Uh, that's another way of dealing with it, um, I think. But um, I can see also my I can tell my daughter, for example, is stressed about her credit card debt, and credit to her, she says, "Dad, I don't want you to step in. I'm going to solve it by myself by finding a job and things like that." Right? I'm not. Gonna, I'm, don't, I'm not. I don't want you to step in. I'm like, okay. So she's going through that right now, and I think it helps her build her resilience, but. I think in the hearts of hearts, both of, both of us would know that I'll backstop her after this period of building resilience, right? Suffer six months for it, and then, and then I'll come in and just say, okay, you know what, let me alleviate half of it or something, yeah? um, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's the kind of thing. You have to go through it. Okay, there are two interesting questions which, uh, you want to add on to that? No, no, I, I saw my name on the yeah. political question. <laughs> yes, and I think this one should be address, open. Uh, yeah, uh, windfall. One is saying that whether ESB loan makes sense for investment. Uh, I, I, I think if it's just ESB, it's not a loan, definitely it's a good investment. Any investment is good. But when you tie it to a loan, then it has to be, you know, what's the cost of the loan and also what's the return that you're going to get. Uh, I think um, on, on that score, if you want to know which can pay better, this, that, this guy is a better person to advise you. <laughs> but then I saw a question saying that Zakat uh, uh, hardcore poor. True, true. I, I, but I did not say just now that um, they are spendthrift. No, that's not what I meant. What I meant was uh, sometimes when you are stuck in a mentality of need, you sometimes, uh, you know, you're confined. You are not. You do not want to to exert yourself to be more innovative. You know, to be more motivated in that sense. So, so I, we, I think we, what you are trying to say is they don't know the other side, so they don't know how to climb out of that, yeah, that level. The, is that yes, right? Yes. So it's not about their 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 spendthrift in that sense. And uh, there's another one which talk about uh, okay, a windfall. <laughs> this is very interesting. I used to think that, you know, last time when, you know, we read Reader's Digest, you know, when I was small, I used to read Reader's Digest, and it's always that there's always contests where you can win money or not. I thought it was just a scam. Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, you always end up buying books. <laughs> you don't get. But to, to unfortunate, I think recently, uh, did they close? Huh? <clears throat> um, but when I was in BSN, I was involved in a scheme simpanan, Sijil uh, Simpanan Premium. So we give out cars every month, BMW, Mercedes. You know. It's real, you know. It's real. It's not. It's not for for show. They they do that. That it is me. And and really so so. I mean, on personal note, I so uh, you know got a windfall. So but 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 the advice is, you know, what do you do with a windfall? If, for example, the windfall is a car, you know. Let me let me intervene first. <laughs> okay. This is the fun fact. He said cannot share. Now I'm going to share. <laughs> Some time ago, not too not too far, 2020. Yes. Uh, Inje Azadin entered a competition. He won a coupe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was. So a, maybe he share what he did with the car. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was a BMW i8. You know. The retail price is 1.4 million, you know. Uh, so, so it's not a competition. It was a lucky draw. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, so what do I do with it? Um, you know, I thought, uh, you know, I've been foolish. I said, why don't I drive the car? <laughs> you know, because at that point of time, when you want to, you know, they, 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 as far as BMW is concerned, they do not want you to sell the car. They want you to, to experience it, you know, to, to experience it. So, but there are other dealers that want to sit at 800,000 at that point of time. You know? So I said, no, I, I want to drive the car. So after two years of driving the car, I sold it at 500,000. <laughs> 300,000 lost. But what the point here is not, is what? If you have a windfall, for example, your car, you might as well sell it because it is a depreciating asset. You get the money, you give to Elvin, <laughs> ask him to structure how to, to manage it. 
if you have a house, probably you can keep it, you know, because it is an investment that can grow. You know, although not now property is so it's more paper value now, you know, because you can't really sell. But if you win just a toaster or microwave, keep it. Make your wife happy. <laughs> Or if you're a student, make your mother happy. <laughs> okay, I think there was a question for Malik regarding entrepreneurship. Did you see that one? Yeah, I saw that one. Something about sort of a group of you, you have no income. Uh, you know, a group of you wanted to build an app. Would you recommend people to become entrepreneurs? I have no money, but I have ideas. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, entrepreneurs create value in, society, in, in, in communities, right? I mean, I mean, my involvement in entrepreneurship probably cause uh, the um, creating incomes for about you know over over the lifetime of my entrepreneurship probably about 500 600 people and i think you know it's it's a livelihood and and, and they move on of course they live with other places but you 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 create that little your portion of the economy right that you you kind of you know you're, i feel you know so doing entrepreneurship if you're creating value you're not doing the kind of entrepreneurship which is like uh good star does anyone know good star okay uh, Jolo lah, Jolo kind of entrepreneurship, <laughs> you know, or the entrepreneurship which is like you know you are the face of the government, you your contract is with someone, you you the face selling to government, but you you know someone else is doing the work. That kind of entrepreneurship doesn't really create value. In fact, that 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 destroys value. But you kind of entrepreneurship where you have uh, ideas and 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 things that employ people that that you know sort of uh, yeah uh, creates creates opportunities for people around you, you know, your your vendors, your suppliers. Your customers, etc. That I think is a great is a great uh, thing. Um, so you don't have money. Right. Nineteen ninety seven. I didn't have money either. So what did I do? I borrow. I don't recommend that. Right. Don't borrow to start entrepreneurship. Don't. There are a lot of stories before in the old days. You know, old days lah. Even think people using credit card to start business. Right. Don't lah. You know, that's that's really crazy. Being being very very uh, risk. Uh, you know, um, high risk person. So. This is one thing I learned. If you can persuade investors to, you know, we call it OPM, other people's money. If you can persuade investors to invest in your app or your business and things like that, then it's, oh no, it's already a, a kind of like a, a test. That's your first test. If you cannot persuade someone to invest, then, you know, you put your own money is a bit, you don't know. You don't know whether, it's, it's not a validation. Right? So get to, to my advice is other people's money, prove to yourself that you can get this validated. And it cannot just be an idea. Right? It cannot just, in some, sometimes you, you can just you can make, get through with a PowerPoint or Figma diagram, whatever it is. But these days, you know, the mood is a bit more tougher. You need to show a prototype. Right? You need to kind of like, you know, build that app first, get people involved. No, not, not paper, you have to actually build it. And that means what we call sweat equity. Lah. You know, you, no salary, no, but yeah, you give your app developer some equity and things like that. You, you, you build it together, you, you give your developer some, some, something, okay, if this works out, I give you 5%, whatever it is, da, 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 kind of thing. So you have to be creative about how you, we call, yeah, how you fund this. We call it in, uh, in, 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 in the Western language, they call it bootstrapping. Lah. You know, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what bootstrapping is. I can't rep, I, I don't go through the experience of bootstrapping, but they call it bootstrapping. That means you don't take other people's money, you just work for your, you, you work with your, your own sweat and figure it out first. Persuade someone, um, persuade someone that it's something that's worth, worth investing to, and then that's one validation. Uh, another form of validation is making sure you, you have a lot, you know, your users use it, and like that. that's another form of validation. So these sort of things, and these things happen. Um, in you know, uh, sometimes I do know there's access. You, you, if you're starting out, you're like, how do I get access to people, right? Um, to who want to invest? And that's a that's a very valid point. Uh, but there are there are more resources now than ever before uh, in terms of helping you out. Cradle is a good place to start. Uh, that's my startup. Uh, that's uh, that's put, has the raw material. You can start going to some of the functions and things like that. Um, you know, so. Um, there's a company, uh, there's a company called, uh, no, company, organization called Endeavor. There's an organization, you know. So a few, there's right now, today, there were none in 1997. I can say, I can, I can tell you that. But now there's at least a dozen, if not more. So 
so go to them, ask them, you know, uh, ask them, go to their events. They do a lot of events. They do want to create entrepreneurs. Go for it, uh, and then fraternize, and then show. Yeah, and do build your prototype in the meantime, right? Do we have time for one more question? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's one question here. Uh, in fact, I think we can combine these two questions because one says, I believe that financial literacy needs to be included in our education system. This will help alleviate financial difficulties. What is your opinion? That's one question. And the second question is, what is being done to influence education curriculums to include in financial literacy? Before I open this up to my panel, uh, my, my, my panelists, um, I'd like to also make note that I know for a fact that many years back, Bank Nagara did incorporate uh, financial literacy into the education system from year four onwards. What they did, the only thing is they never announced it uh, and they didn't track it. That's why they, they didn't show any results and they kept very quiet about it. But what they actually did was they incorporated the syllabus into maths because mathematics is one where you actually do learn about numeracy in relation to financial literacy. It, it is there. It is there. It's just that because they didn't track it, that's why we don't see it today. So now I open up to my panelists. Maybe I take this question. I think uh, it's true, it's true. I think uh, now that under FEN, Financial Education Network, which is also spearheaded by Benagara and SSC, uh, this commission, they're also looking into this aspect because in the FEN, the Ministry of Education is also there. Uh, they're looking into how do you put it into the syllabus. But of course, the, the aim is to have a specific uh, syllab one, one, syllab one uh, uh, topic by itself, what we call one subject by itself, either in schools or universities. But as a part of, of things has been there, in the, even in universities, they have under Chitra, you know, they have under Chitra, and we at KPK also, we have got the personal financial management with two credit hours as, as far as elective, you know, which is taken up a lot by college vocationals and whatnot. But this is ongoing as we go, and, and I do agree that it has to be a subject by itself. Like it's a living skill that needs to be, uh, to be uh, to make it mandatory to everybody. Yeah. Uh, my kids, three kids went through a Singapore education system, and sometimes I've been um, asked as a volunteer, a parent volunteer, uh, for they, they, the schools there, the public schools there actually employ um, private, private providers to do uh, a day, half a day, every now and then. Yeah? So I remember I was involved as a parent volunteer. It's interesting, um, even before we arrived, the, the, you know, the teacher will ask, uh, what, you know, children, what do you think? Uh, what, what do we like? Do we want, do we, is this a need or is this a one? I'm like, wow, primary three, yeah? They're teaching, they already taught needs and wants, you know? No, the things that we're talking here. It's a one. Yeah, so like, and then the, 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 the things are, so I'm like, it's quite wow. So I'm like, wow, they, they, I don't know how it's being implemented because definitely they didn't learn from our two half day courses. The parents were so a bit confused, right? Uh, what's need in one, okay. Uh, but they, but the, the kids were already, already, already knew that. Lah. But still, again, um, as they grow up also, you know, not necessarily the case, but at least and, uh, you had that first introduction. And I think this, has, I mean, I, I'm 57 years old and I'm constantly need to be reminded, honestly. Every time um, uh, we, we have at BFM, we have, we organize this, um, you know, financial, we, every time there's bonus time, we bring financial planners in so that people don't spend immediately, right? And every time they come in, I always attend because it's such, it's so refreshing just to like being told things again and you just like, you listen to it the second time, third time, it's never, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's never the same and it, it gives new insights as well as like affirms things that you have done and reminds you also things that you haven't done. Uh, and it, you, know, you always need a cost, a bit of a like cost correction every now and then. So I, I think, uh, you know, I think it has to be throughout, throughout our lives, right? You know? Yeah, that's right. Someone should have gone to you after you got that BMW and say, yeah, the two years of using BMW, that's a want, not a need. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, anyway, just to let you know, uh, BFM, uh, a few years ago, they actually gave financial literacy to their staff. Um, they collaborated with FPM. So actually, FPM 
did um, I think a few sessions and uh, the feedback was very good. Um, in fact, uh, after that, we hear some of the staff come back and say, hey, you know, uh, this is an update of what from the last sessions that we had. So there are good, uh, there are good experiences. So I think we've come to the end of a session. Uh, there are a lot more good questions. Uh, unfortunately, time does not permit. And so uh, maybe um, I would like to thank all of you, uh, both online as well as also here today, for your attention and participation. I encourage um, all of you to continue learning about personal finances. We have put some resources there. We will, uh, MIM is going to distribute that like, uh, later. Some of the websites we are, which are genuine that you can go to for personal uh, lessons. And also, um, I'd like to wish everyone the best on your journey to financial wellness. I now hand over the mic to the MC. Thank you.